Alright, hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Trisha with Insectopia, and we are here on this Sunday afternoon uh, to talk a little bit about a subfamily of longhorn beetles. This is the guy I pulled out. Um, I didn't hear anybody in chat asking for anything in particular, so I went into the collection to see if there was something different or new or interesting that we hadn't sketched yet. Um, so these longhorn beetles, normally you recognize longhorn beetles as these, um, beetles that have this oblong shake, shape, but they have really, really long antenna, right? And that's why they're called longhorn beetles, is because of their long antenna. Well, this is a longhorn beetle too, and its antenna is not broken off. It's in its own special little, well, I'll start here. So I had just written longhorn beetle, right? So longhorn beetle is a family of insects. And so that's <clears throat> cerambicity is the whole family of longhorn beetles. And most cerambicids or most longhorn beetles are going to have very, very, very long antenna. But there are many subfamilies of cerambicids, right? So you've got family, and then you have subfamily. And then in insects, you even have tribes, and then you have a genus and a species. And so with, um, with cerambicids, that's all of them. But this one in particular is in a subfamily that we call parandrini. Parandrini? Yeah. That's what we call it. Um, <coughs> so you see that our family names end in D-A-E, and our subfamily names end in I-N-A-E. All right? Um, if you look at tribe names for insects, they end in I-N-I. -I. So that's a little bit of etymology for you guys out there who are interested in and words and the like. All right, so parandrini is our subfamily, and that's about as far as I'm going to be able to go right now. I do believe there are something like two genera in North America, um, but I'm not sure if I've ever looked up which one it might be. I think I may have, but they're in one of my notes in one of my journals. I just don't have time to grab them right now, I don't think. So... Uh, we're going to go ahead and get this party started. I wish that there was a name for the this type of um, longhorn beetle with the short antenna, but there is not really a common name for the subfamily. Um, there is a common name for one of the genera. Um, there's one genus that is named the pole borers. So we could almost call them pole borers, but I'm not sure if they're pole borers or just closely related. Just not sure. <clears throat> All right. So I'm going to start it. Longhorn beetle. And then underneath it, I'll go ahead and write parandrini. Paradrini. Drine. If anybody knows their, um, if anyone knows their Latin linguistics, I wouldn't mind knowing exactly how you're supposed to pronounce that one. I would guess it's para paran Per parandrini, but all right. So looking at our beetle as a whole is probably not going to be able to happen underneath our microscope because it's a pretty good sized beetle we've got here. I don't think it's going to fit. I'm going to try and put it kind of diagonal. Because there's, oh, yay, there's a possibility that it fits this way. Awesome. Maybe. Let's go ahead and get it measured then. So I'm going to measure it not from the front of the mouth parts, but from the front of the head. And measure from the front of the head 
all the way back to the back of the abdomen. here is 1.65 centimeters long. 1.65 centimeters. So it's over one and a half centimeters. That's pretty good. Uh, you can see that it's covered in punctations. That's one of those words that we like to learn and share. Um, it means that it has, looks like it has little punctures all over its body. Hello, how are you doing today? Welcome. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started with a light sketch of our of what our beetle looks like, and you guys can just come, um, follow along with me. So, the front of our head, the front of our head is going to be fairly flat like this and I'm not consider I'm leaving enough space up above this line for the mandibles because obviously our really awesome longhorn beetle needs those really large mandibles to be able to chew through wood. Um, the immature stage, the immature form of this beetle is going to be a borer, meaning that it's going to be chewing through, likely wood, but I think that it, they'll also bore other plants. I'm not sure which one this one gets to bore. So I've got that kind of flat, longer head shape. Uh, with our really light outline in the beginning, we don't need to give um, space for the eyes or anything like that. We'll be zooming in on each feature so that we can go ahead and see. If you wanted, you could give yourself these kind of very basic mandibles um, so that you know about what size they should be. Because sometimes when we zoom in on our our specimen, it gets difficult to see how large each body part should be in comparison to each other. So that's what this is all about, is making sure that we can see. So I'm going to go ahead and give our beetle some mandibles about the size that I think we're going to need. And then coming back from the head, we get the pronotum right here. So sometimes this is expanded to be a kind of a shield that blocks a beetle's head. Um, sometimes uh, pronotums can extend back and protect some of the body. This one is just a nice little rectangle here. It's the first segment of the thorax. So it has an important job. It has the first pair of legs connected to it, and it has the first pair of wings connected to it. Um, we're just going to give this kind of this wide rectangle shape, but you can go ahead and give your, like, the edges of your pronotum kind of little points up. I believe it's going to have that, but we're going to have to, when we zoom in, we're going to have to check that out. All right, so moving on back from our pronotum, we've got a couple of things. What we're looking at on the, on the back there, um, what we're looking at on the back there are the front wings or the elytra. Um, if you're curious, that's spelled elytra. Um, and that's specifically the front wings of a beetle. Beetles will have those hard, um, we call it sclerotized, or those very hard elytra. Um, sometimes people will think of it like, you know, beetles, like, uh, they, they have this outer armor. And so their front wings are less used for flight and more used to just protect the membranous wings underneath. All right, so I'm going to give our but our beetles um, elytra are actually pretty long. So I'm just giving myself a center line and trying to get it to be about the length that I would like it. And then I can give us the rest of our elytra. And I think, you know what we can do? We can actually use the microscope measurement. 
So I can measure from the front of the head to the back of the pronotum. And then, so that's 0.5 centimeters. And if I measure from here to here, that's one centimeter. So um, 1.09. So what you can do is you can just take the length of your head and your pronotum together and you double it and that will give you the length of your elytra. And that's what's cool about ratios. Let's see. Yeah, that's about right. Knock that down just a little bit. There we go. And this is going to be a really good sized beetle because I'll be able to fit all of the legs and all of the, uh, the antenna and everything onto the sketch. That'll be nice. Um, they do meet in the center. They do meet in the center evenly, the elytra. And I'm going to be fixing some of these lines when we zoom in. I think this one needs to curve up a little bit better. So we've got this very even U on the bottom side of the elytra, just, so just trying to get that right. And then the edges of the elytra are parallel to one another. Coming on up. All right. So I also like to go ahead and give us some kind of stick legs so that we know about where the legs are going to be coming out of the body and about how long they have to be. So our front pair of legs are going to be coming out from the, right about the back of here. It's the back of the pronotum coming out and then in and then up and then, yeah. And then in the middle, up, down, out, and then on the hind leg we'll be coming more like this. My front leg might be shorter. We'll have to, when we zoom in, we'll have to check on the length of each of these legs. Let's check them out. Sometimes my microscope camera complains when I move too quickly. Look at this beautiful beetle. Oh, look at his face. I'm going to angle him up just a little bit so that when we look at his face, we can see his eyes and his mandibles evenly. Um, when we're looking at a microscope, we want to get the, the what, what's most important to us on the same plane so that we can be focused on both of them at the same time. So I can go ahead and angle our beetle up towards the, the microscope just a little bit, and we're going to have a way better angle than if our beetle was just flat because um, this beetle sits with its head kind of angled down towards the ground naturally. Look at how awesome those antenna are! Okay. All right, so looking at this overall shape for the head of our longhorn beetle, of the head of our perandrony, um, we'll notice that we kind of gave these um, 
parentheses shapes and then just um, put them evenly across. Whereas uh, the head's going to go forward and then it's going to come out for the eyes and go back in. So I'm going to erase these angles here and go ahead and fix that. So we're going to be coming mostly up parallel sides. All right, and then from here, our compound eyes are going to be what we call reniform. You'll see this a lot when you're talking about um, cerambicids or longhorn beetles. They have reniform compound eyes, meaning that their compound eyes, these big ones on the, the left, they are the shape of kidney beans or kidneys. Reniform is in the shape of a kidney. So if we look right about here, we can see that they come in a little bit. They're indented. Um, and a lot of times they're indented because the antennal socket is so close to the compound eye. Now, um, in this genus, it's not as evident unless I turned the beetle and we looked at it head on and we really zoomed in. Um, but I promise you it's there. So we're going to add our compound eye here. I can go ahead and give myself about how tall I want it to be. And then you want to go out and then back in to give yourself that, that kind of a half of a reniform shape. But then when you're going around, you don't have to show that whole thing because it's wrapping around the head. So you can just give yourself one half kind of circle here and that'll get it, that'll get the shape right. So you can do that same thing on the other side. You've gotten to a space, you want to come up and give yourself a little mark for kind of the, the width that you would like the eye. And then you scoop up towards the mandibles and down to give yourself that kidney shape. And then one convex circle there. And hopefully uh, they are pretty even, right? Because insects are always symmetrical. So making sure that the left side and the right side are at least pretty close is important. I'm going to go ahead and pick my head up a little bit so you, it's a little closer to the camera. I think my camera is doing, has a funny setting on it. Give me a moment. I think that'll be better. Yeah. All right, so moving up from now it's autofocusing, and it shouldn't have autofocus on. All right, so moving up from our compound eyes, we move up just a little bit, and then we're going to be adding our antennal sockets. Now, these guys look kind of funny. They're, uh, they're scape. All right, so these guys, um, you can talk about three different parts of the antenna. The scape is the first segment of the antenna. So it's that first kind of bulbous rectangular, rectangular one coming out from the head. You can see it here. Um, then you have the pedestal. It's this little circular one right here. Um, and here, that's the second segment of the antenna. And then the rest of them are the flagellum. And you'll notice they all have very similar shapes. And so a lot of times we give these three unique antenna segments names because they are, they, they generally have different shapes and they generally have different functions. And so they gave them different, different types of names. So let's go ahead and give ourselves at least that first antennal segment, that bulbous scape. So we've got that scape, and then the pedestal is 
So these guys are interesting because their antennal segments seem to have spaces between each of them. And that is going to be a detail that's a little bit trickier because you have to leave a little bit of space and give yourself um, kind of essentially short lines so that you can leave yourself enough space and connect your room. So if you're looking at that maybe bigger so that you can see what I'm talking about, you've got this first bulbous section, and then your next section, segment, you want it to have a little bit of space, um, but you want it to still connect. So you'll come in something like this, and you'll give these two kind of connected chin lines. You can even make it a little wider if you want. Um, but then you have space and a segment. Right, but you're doing it really, really tiny because you're making them. It's in these antennal segments, right here and here. Okay. All right, we are gonna have to continue that one, and I think that we're pro we're likely gonna want to count the antennal segments too. Um, let's go ahead and do that. Why not? Looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There are 11 tunnel, 11 in tunnel segments. So, um, that is actually going to be pretty important because I do remember keying out some of these longhorn beetles. And even though they have very long antenna, you do get two questions, how long the antenna are in comparison to the body. But you also get that question about how many antennal segments are there. Because even though longhorn beetles have really, really long antenna, their antennal segments tend to be longer also. All right. So the, um, we mentioned, I think we said 11, right? Yeah, 11. So we have 11 antennal segments, but we have the scape and the pedicel. So we have nine on the flagellum, and I would say eight that are this cup shape. So you can create a cup and then another cup with just a little bit of space and then connect them at the bottom. And we want to do that eight times. So one, two, one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight. Something like that where you can see the individual segments. Mine is a little bit, mine's a little bit rough. I think I'm going to have to work on that a little bit. But our last segment is a little bit different. It's not just that cup segment. It comes out, and it comes out to a point. It meets more like this. Um, I'm going to be coming back and fixing up those, an those antennal segments, but uh, you guys don't have to watch me do that. I want to move over and check out some of these mandibles. And I think that that's what you guys want, too. So we are looking at the front of the head of our longhorn beetle in the subfamily Parandrini. 
Um, we, the, we just finished looking at these longer antenna, and we're going to be coming back to where the antenna segment started, and we're going to make that really nifty 90 degree angle up here, because you can see if we move it, like, right about here, there's a pretty, it is a little bit rounded off, but that's a pretty straight, um, uh, that's like a pretty strict angle and so we're gonna go ahead and give that and then the ridges along the front of the head we're gonna be sketching those in so coming up and over up and over and then it looks like we come in a little bit at the very beginning where you might imagine the mandibles have like a musculature in there. So um, right here, kind of the base of the mandibles that comes in a little bit. And then from there, we wait until about the center of the mouth and then there's just the one um, peak in the center. All right. Now we're going to be looking at the edges of the mandibles. And I think that we did actually a pretty good job on the outline of our mandibles at the very beginning. And so I'm just going to go ahead and darken the outside. The inside, you can see we're going to be adding all of the... Um, the teeth on the mandibles. There's a word for those. Alright, so we've got the outside of those mandibles taken care of, and I'm just going to go ahead and erase our inside now. Um, the inside were also there just so that I knew how far in it should go. So we've got our points taken care of. Now it looks like there's the first one and then two that are kind of together. So I would say that we're going for three, um, three teeth dentations. Might be dentations. Oh, so we want this arch to end not there, but closer to like here. So I'm going to give myself these light lines to work off of so I know where the dentation should be. So the first one comes off the center line like this. And then the second one and two come off like little mountains. And leaving that center line there helps me get where exactly this angle should be following. And I might pull the inside the outside in just a little bit. Yeah. All right, so now all I have to do is make the, um, make the right side match the left side. So as a grub, best uh, as a grub, longhorn beetles are um, living in logs and they're bo boring in trees. Um, some of them bore in living trees, and some of them bore in already dead and dying trees. 
Um, some of them bore in decaying logs. And so it just depends on which species, which genus you're looking at as to what it may have come out of. There are even longhorn beetles down in Arizona and Texas and New Mexico that um, bore in cacti. So if there's a plant that they can bore into and feed off of its nutrients, they're likely going to be there. Um, there are many different species of longhorn beetles in the Amazon and rainforest regions that are ginormous. Um, they're actually pretty beautiful. Oh, Nancy, I'm so glad you're here. How are you doing today? Kia is beautiful. I love them. So we are looking at the pronotum. Come into focus for me. There we go. Alright, so we are looking at the pronotum, and this is the first segment of the thorax. You can see that it does have this nice angle up, but it might have it might not have as sharp as sharp of spines as we first guessed. Um, you still have all of those little pokes all over its body. If you wanted to have a name for that kind of um, texture in insects. The name for that texture is punctations. So those are all, we would call those punctations, or the name of the, the actual texture, I guess, would be punctate. So you could say, our beetle is highly punctate. Or you could say, you could talk about the density of the punctations. Sometimes they do that. And it makes you sound all fancy like. All right, so we just want to make sure that the edges of the pronotum are evenly spaced. And it's kind of hugging the head up here, so I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, the texturing inside of the pronotum is uh, has a border around the edge, and I think that that's pretty cool. So when I'm coming in here, I'm actually going to, I'm going to make this outer line pretty dark, and then I'm going to put a thinner line on the inside. Kind of like this to give the, uh, the pronotum a little bit of a border. And then I might even um, add some of the punctations to our friend here. But let's see what happens. So um, the bottom edge of our pronotum, it starts kind of coming in. And then it's going to come down and plateau and then come back up. Something like that, as long as it's even across. There we go. All right, and then we're going to continue this borderline to around the bottom. I just hadn't gotten there yet, so here we go. Awesome. So we've got the outer line, we've got the inner line. I'm pretty happy with that. Um... We'll worry about the we'll worry about the legs after we figure out the rest of its body. I think that the legs are going to be a little bit weird because of the fact that I think the legs are pretty short and I don't want to make him look funny. So we're going to have to see what happens when we get to the legs. Now I kind of wanted to instead of show you the entire elytra at one time, I kind of wanted to zoom in and show you the scutellum first. So let's go look at that. Alrighty, so if we are looking 
looking at the dorsal or the back of our beetle here, this little U shape, that thing right in there, that's what we call the scutellum. It's on the, um, it's between the two elytra. We call it a scutellum, spelled that way. And then we've got it, the left elytron and the right elytron. Um, cause elytron is the, uh, the singular word. So coming down from the very center of our body, some people even like to start with a center line just to make sure their insects are, um, are, uh, even across. But right here at the center line, we're going to be giving ourselves that U-shaped scutellum. Oh no, mine's off to the left. We're going to fix that really quick. Yep, that's better. Alright, so we've got that little scutellum taken care of. It's small, but it's mighty when you're making sure that the edges of your elytra are even and stuff. Having the scutellum there right in the center does help make everything else a little easier. So we're going to go ahead and zoom as far out as we need to see the entire elytra. And I'm going to go ahead and tilt them back up so that now the elytra are on a flat um are on a flat surface for us he much prefers the um not the direct light, but kind of a little bit of indirect light on the microscope. Whenever I give him too much direct light, he seems to kind of wash out a little bit. We're going to leave it right about there. All right, so I'm going to be, I'm going to just go ahead and erase these edges. I think that I'm going to be bringing them in just a little bit because where there is a separation between the elytra and the pronotum, there isn't a lot, it isn't a lot larger, it's just separated. So from here, remember how we went down just a little bit? Our elytra are going to connect at the base of the pronotum, but then they're going to separate. Like this. Because then you have those edges to work with. And you don't want them to be and you want them to be pretty close to 90 degrees, but you want to round those edges off. You don't want them to be sharp. And because we actually did measure the length of our elytra in the beginning, you can go ahead and give yourself the length. Um, just make sure that when you come down to the bottom, you're still making sure that it is a nice even U where the elytra meet one another. Alright, now let's do the left side. How many of you are sketching along with me? Sometimes I'm curious if the people who are watching are sketching or just listening and learning. Just trying to make sure that this, um, the edge of this elytra is nice and even with the left side. I think that, I think that the left side ended up being just a little bit longer than the right side. So I'm actually going to pull the right side down because I was having a hard time with that side. So if I can make it even by changing this side, 
I think I will. Don't mind me while I accidentally bump the camera once or twice. I was trying to get it just right. All right, now I'm going to give myself an even center line. with him he definitely needs some work on his antenna but um he's uh overall looking pretty good um i think that the way that this beetle is holding its legs on the left is gonna be the most realistically um most realistic looking uh, kind of in real life and you see how short its legs look in comparison to its body um kind of because of how the legs are tucked underneath it. Sketching these one, this one's going to be a little interesting, but let's try to do it anyway. Because, um, you can see that, um, they are not very long. So the femur is mostly going to be a segment that looks like this. Just comes off the body a little bit. And then the tibia, because the tibia is moving down away from the body and away from the scope, um, it doesn't look like it's very long, but that's mostly because of the angle it's at. So if you start kind of narrow and you go wide quickly, you can get that kind of effect, like it's, like it had moved away from you. And then our tarsal segments are going to be going out, but I think I want to make this just a little bit longer. There we go. And then our t t tarsal segments are going to be going out in that direction. Um... Um... Uh, Sorry, longhorn beetles have a 555 tarsal formula. It took me a minute to remember, and I wanted to make sure I was correct. So, um, longhorn beetles, or beetles in the family Cerambicidae, have, we call it apparently 444, but 555 tarsal segments. Um, <clears throat> I think a number of you have heard me describe this in the past. But um, what these tarsal segments look like is, let's see, we'll go ahead and sketch it big right here so I can show you. Um, the first segment is kind of like this rectangle here. Um, the second segment is generally kind of like a triangular segment. And then the third segment is also triangular. Nope. Counted wrong. Give me a minute. One, two, three, four, five. Right. So our third segment is not that triangular segment, but it's actually that heart-shaped segment. Sometimes um, we've seen it on a couple of other beetles. Um, let's see... I believe leaf beetles have this same tarsal segment where it almost looks like a heart, but then on the bottom of it, there's a lot of these long hairs that kind of work as padding. Um, this is the segment that's mostly going to be on the ground. And then you have this fourth hidden segment that's kind of in between what you might like say are the toes, right? So right about here, there's a little itty bitty tiny segment that no one can see. And so we call this apparently 444 because there is one more segment. It's nice and long. It's a raindrop shape where it's kind of wider at the end than the beginning, but it also kind of arches a little bit. And then it comes down to having a um, two tarsal claws.
And so we call this apparently 444 because people see 1, 2, 3, 4 and call it good. Except that there is that hidden tarsal segment in between the toes at the base of this segment. It's just because nobody sees it, we don't count it. If you counted it in the keys, you would end up with a whole bunch of confused entomologists. And I don't know if you've ever tried to use an entomology key, but um, we're already a little confused. Aw, thank you. So um, she mentions that she's drawn a couple of times, but um, just likes listening to stories. I like sharing stories, so happy to have you here. So I'm going to go ahead and take that tarsal formula that I drew really big and make it really small right up here as part of the front leg. And they're going to be these nice short segments because they are pretty far away from the camera because we're trying to make it look like those legs are kind of short in comparison to the body. They're away from the body. Um, if you made him look too long, you'd make him look like an ant beetle. And that's why when I drew these ones and they were so long, I was like, oh no, he can't look like that. His legs aren't long enough to look like that. Um, and if you look at, for instance, our middle leg right here, it's not, it's mostly not even visible from the top. I'm going to angle it like this so that we'll be able to see most of it. There we go. So our middle leg is coming out from just a little bit behind where the elytra are. And the femur is fat and stocky and comes out right around here. Our tibia comes out and makes that really cool little arch guy. I like it a lot. So the tibia has this really cool flare. It reminds me of like wearing flare jeans or something. Um, and then it has the same tarsal formula, front, middle, and hind legs. So you can go ahead and add those in there. All right. I think my middle leg could have been a little bit larger. I don't know. Let's go see. All right. I'm going to fix this just a little bit. I think... That's better. And then the hind leg, it doesn't come out for until way back here. And that's silly because, you know, all, all of the legs are on the thorax, right? So we're going to have to flip this beetle upside down to see where the thorax ends and where the abdomen begins. And on this one, we can't even see the femur. We only see the tibia coming out about here. And then that's what I'm going to draw. I'm just going to draw the tibia starting here and then the tarsal segments because... Um, I'm trying to get it as realistic as possible without worrying too much. Sounds good to me. Let's flip them over.
just like from the underside. So you can see that where we kind of saw those hind legs, um, there was a little bit of a femur kind of hidden underneath here and here. But then you have the tibia and the tarsi. This beetle, um, this beetle just has kind of these short stubby legs that aren't really too visible from the top side. It's not my fault. You have silly legs. You make my drawing look silly. All right, and this is what the bottom side of his face looks like. Or I guess we can call it his head. Cool. We can see practically into its mandibles. You can see his mouth hole. That's awesome. And his uh, mandibles are angled a little bit. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. I was going to check my old college notes and see what the, um, what the defining characteristics were for cerambicids because I remember it being, well, the antenna, which this fam, which this subfamily breaks the rules to, and then the reniform eyes, I remember, but there are a handful of families of beetles that have reniform eyes. So I'm going to see if I can look up. Um, I'm going to see if I can look up these beetles really quick. Come on, come on, come on. All right. Nope. I just wrote down the notched eyes, the, um, the uh, tarsal formula being uh, 555, five, five, but apparently 444, four, four. and then the antenna. So those are the characters that I had written down for this guy. But most in the subfamily, they have this, they look exactly like this. They have the same color, the same body shape. So, um, it's like, you remember cerambicids have the long antenna, but then you just remember that these guys break the rules. And then you've got them all down. All right. Oh, you're enjoying the, uh, you're enjoying the eyes, um, selling Nancy? I can go ahead and zoom in there. Maybe. Let's see. So they only have the compound eyes. They don't have any simple eyes. Ooh, look at that. We can see the individual lenses and the compound eyes. Yep, um, cerambicids are strong flyers. Um, they also have this heat sensing organ between their second and third legs on the bottom side of their body that use that they use to um, sense heat. And so what they'll do is they'll sense the heat of rotting logs and um, determine. Um, by the temperature that the logs are rotting, they'll know at what stage of decomposition the log is or whether or not their babies will be able to survive in the logs. 
So these longhorn beetles, they'll fly around in the woods and they'll use their heat sensor and they'll look for a log that's the perfect temperature for their babies. Um, and that's where they're going to lay their eggs for their babies to hatch and to nom on all of that rotting wood. So that's kind of nifty. All right, so we've been going for about an hour. I really enjoyed having all of you guys here with me. I think most of us stuck around for about 30 minutes, but, um, you know, if you would like to hang out with me longer, you always can. Um, join the chat and um, ask me bug questions. We have a great time. So, um... This is my live stream closer. I want to say thank you everybody for hanging out with me today and drawing this very unique longhorn beetle. I also teach on a platform called OutSchool. It's for students that are um, school aged. So 5 to 8, 9 to 12. I also have the ability to teach high schoolers if um, you know a high schooler that's interested in taking like an introduction to entomology class. I can take, I can teach that for you. So, um, uh, as always, make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube channel. You can only comment in my chat box now if you are subscribed to the channel. All right. Um, that makes sure that our um, the people who are interested and in wanting to learn have the ability to chat without being having crazy bots all over the place. All right, this is my, this right there, that's the QR code that links directly to my PayPal. It gives you the ability to donate to Insectopia if you um, are feeling the need. If you've learned from this, if you've had a great time listening to me talk about longhorn beetle beetles and serumbicids, if I answered any of your questions, go ahead and... Um, Go ahead and donate. If that QR code doesn't work, you can always go ahead and use the link in the description box below. Have a wonderful rest of your week, and I will see you either Thursday at 10 p.m. Eastern or next Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern. Goodbye. Stay buggy.